It was announced that the devil was going out of business and would offer all tools for sale to whoever would pay his price. On the night of the sale, they, they were all attractively displayed and a bad-looking lot they were, malice, hatred, envy, jealousy, sensuality, deceit, and all the other implements of evil were spread out, each marked with its own price. Apart from the rest lay a harmless-looking wedge-shaped tool, much worn and priced higher than any of the others. Someone asked the devil what it was. That's discouragement, was his reply. Well, why do you have it priced so high? Because, replied Satan, it's more useful to me than any of the others. I can pry open and get inside a man's consciousness with that, and when I could not get near him, when I could not get near him with any of the other tools. When once inside, I can use him in whatever way suits me best. It is so much, it is so much worn because I use it with nearly everybody. As very few people yet know, it belongs to me. Has anybody ever been discouraged in their life ever? Okay, 100% of us. Okay. There's some of you who live your life, you wonder if you're ever going to get out of discouragement. Am I right? Well, folks, I believe, you know, we did, we did that big list of, you know, nine things or eight things last week and the things we are tempted with and all of those things. When you, when you give in to temptation, have you ever noticed when you give it in to temptation, the immediate response, well, you feel woeful, hopefully, but it's discouragement. Man, I messed up. And discouragement sets in. And for me, that's far worse than any of those nine you could commit. Because a lot of times we allow discouragement to take control of our life. Like he said in this, you know, this little analogy, this little story here, boy, the enemy knows how to get inside of our mind and create that. And we don't even know why sometimes. You know, we're Christ followers. We love Jesus. He's with us all the time. We've gone through this the last few weeks. But yet discouragement still sets in no matter how hard we try, no matter what we do. Discouragement still comes. And we can't do anything about it. And the enemy knows that. And it's a well-worn tool. This morning, I want you to know, I believe there's an adversary. He's been called the deceiver, the liar, Lucifer, devil, Satan, destroyer, and countless other names. You can, you can use whatever one you want this morning. And we get a little picture of him in the story of Job, uh, of what, what he's like. You know, say, Satan says to God, he only loves you because of the stuff he has, his great family, and his health is good. And God says back, do anything, do anything you want to him, but you cannot lay a finger on him. And then if you know the story, you know Job ends up losing his family, his wealth, and his health. And he has three friends, three great friends, who tried to convince him that the stuff he was going through in life was because he had sinned against God somehow. He'd let God down, and God was just punishing him for what that. And his wife even said to him, what a lovely wife, said to him, curse God and die. In other words, his wife said, you know, just give up on God. You know, why don't you just die? You know, that's the best way out. See, the enemy hopes Job cursed God and dies. And later on in the story, you can read about God talking to Job. Okay, now, mind you, Job was losing, he's lost, his, he lost all of his kids, which is a tragedy for any parent. You know, he's lost all of his, he's lost his livestock, his, his way of life. He's lost all of that. He's lost his health. He's sitting there with ashes on his head and boils. Okay? Get that in your mind. And you read what God says in talking to Job. And then when you read this, and God appears very unkind, he says to Job, who in the heck are you? Did you make the water stop where it's supposed to? Did you, did you make the giraffe's neck so long? God, Okay. What did Job do to deserve that? I looked, I read it and read it. I said, what did, what did Job do to deserve that kind of treatment from God? Sometimes, you know, in our life, you know, God's kind of mean, isn't he? You know, he's mean. He doesn't give us what we want when we want it. He doesn't answer the prayer when we, say, when we pray it. We wonder if he's ever listening. And, and in those moments when he doesn't do the things, in those moments, I think is the greatest discouragement because then that creates, boy, is there a God or not? 
Is he really listening to me or not? And, you know, discouragement, you know, you know, tagged with doubt, boy, you can see where that path leads. The, the enemy couldn't destroy Job, but he could discourage him. Discouragement is the number one destroyer of faith. Did you know not, not any of those other nine? All those, all of those things, you know, we ask for God for forgiveness with a sincere, tar, sincere heart, and we can start anew. But once discouragement sets in, it, will, it can destroy you. Ask anyone who's, who, who lives, you know, in that depressed state, you know, and, and can't, you know, has trouble functioning. I mean, discouragement is just almost a, a way of life. And they, and they have to deal with it and walk through with it. And, and sometimes I wonder, wow, how do they do it? But discouragement is the number one destroyer of faith. Not any of those temptations that we give into. Discouragement, because after that, there is discouragement. Look at what Job was going through. Where do you think the enemy was attacking? He, you know, he took everything, and the only thing he had left was to attack the mind and get him discouraged. And, you know, and then he has this lovely wife who, you know, just kind of enunciates it and says, just curse God and die. Job, just give up. It's not worth it. Live in your discouragement and die. Well, the enemy, couldn't, the enemy couldn't destroy him, but he could discourage him. And Job lost everything and all of his kids, and he lost his, you know, all of that. And then, then you read this in the bottom of in Job 1. He says that this, okay, he's going through all this. He tore his robe and shaved his head, and he fell in the ground, fell to the ground in worship and said, Naked I come from my mother's womb, and naked I will depart. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised are you kidding me? When you're in the midst, those of you who have been discouraged, which is all of you, is your first reaction to praise God? Raise your hand if that's your first reaction. Oh, God, thank you. I'm so discouraged. Thank you that I don't have a job. Thank you. I have this disease in my body that's killing me. Anybody praise God for that? If you do, you have a sick mind. <laughs> you know? But here he is going through all this, and that's all he does if you read that. If you read all, I think it's worth, worth your read, worth your time. Take 20 minutes and read 40 chapters of Job. You know, I think it'll give you a good perspective on life. You know, everybody, as we, you know, in that little clip there, everybody goes through pain, everybody suffers, everybody speaks experiences tragedy and uncertainty and everyone if it's not any of those whatever life throws at you it, all of those things whatever life comes at you how it comes at you it always leads to discouragement and i watched this video a couple of weeks ago this broke my heart you know and some of you might have seen it but it's about this young lady uh she's about 29 years old and, uh who lives in oregon and has an operable brain tumor and moved to Oregon. She'll explain it here in just a minute. She moved to Oregon so she could die, legally die on her own. And um, as you watch that, what I'd like for you to think, and if you have the half sheet there, what would you say to her? The thoughts that go through your mind when you find out you have so little time is everything that you need to say to everyone that you love. So after getting married is when I first started experiencing the headaches and they were quite severe and I didn't understand them because I had never had anything like that before in my life. Right when I was diagnosed, my husband and I were actively trying for a family, which is heartbreaking for us both. And then I was diagnosed this past New Year's. We went away to the wine country for kind of a New Year's Eve celebration and um, by Jan 1, the following day, I was diagnosed with cancer and told I was terminally ill. I 
was told I had a grade two astrocytoma. Um, Anne was told anywhere from three, maybe five, up to 10 years to live. I have to tell you when you're 29 years old, being told you have that kind of timeline still feels like you're being told you're gonna die tomorrow. 70 days post-op, I went in for another MRI and was told I had had a grade change. They were looking and saying it looks like grade four, um, which is the worst and most aggressive form of brain cancer. It's called a glioblastoma. So that was a major shock to my system and the system of my family because it went from having potentially years of time to being told I had like six months. My parents spent a couple months, they just wanted to search for a miracle. In the beginning I hoped for everything. I hope, First I hoped that they had just the wrong uh, x-rays, the wrong set of scans. It was all just a big clerical mishap. Your brain will do really strange things to you when you don't want to believe something. You will come up with fairy tales. I don't wake up every day and look at it. <laughs> um, it's in a safe spot and I know that it's there when I need it. I plan to be surrounded by my immediate family, which is my husband and my mother and my stepfather and my best friend, who's also a physician, um, and probably not much more people. Um, and I will die upstairs in my bedroom that I share with my husband, um, with my mother and my husband by my side and pass peacefully with some music that I like in the background. Okay. What'd you say to her? In case she couldn't read it, she had a brain cancer that was, that increased in size and she, she, and it, she there's no way that she can, no way she'll live. What would you say to her? I don't know if she's a woman of faith or not. It doesn't make a difference, does it? <laughs> what would you say? You know? And obviously, this video is creating a lot of discussion. You know, it's on YouTube if you want to watch it all. Uh, about the right to end your own life and when facing disease that's only going to destroy you. You know, there's no cure for her disease. She obviously has the right to do what she wants. She will be the one suffering the debilitating headaches. And she is the one who has to walk around with a tumor that is destroying her brain. This is one of those stories that makes no, this is one of those stories that really makes no sense to me, and that's why it caught my eye. One of those, sto one of those stories you stop and you ask God, why don't you heal her? God, where are you at in the midst of her story? And I can't help but wonder I can't prove it. I can't help but wonder how much discouragement has to play in the role of making such a decision. Folks, she's dying in a couple weeks. November 1, 2014. I'm praying that God will use her story in some redeeming way. And I'm also praying, you know, I prayed after I watched it, I prayed, God, will you do a miracle in her life? And, you know, because, and, and, God, if you do this miracle in, in, in her life, it's going to create a lot of discussion about who you are. Folks, I think almost a million people have watched this video. God, why don't you do something? Can't you see the broob, the tumor in her brain? I don't care whether she loves you or not. Why don't you do something? I don't know, but you could kind of see it in her eyes. Maybe I was looking for it intentionally, but that discouragement, boy, there's nowhere else to turn. Well, we can get super religious here and say, oh, yes, there is a turn. She can turn to God. Well, just because she turns to God doesn't mean she's going to be healed. You know, she's about to take her life on November 1, just in a couple weeks. 
I got a feeling discouragement plays a role in that. And, and discouragement, you know, and you know, you know it. Discouragement can destroy our dreams. It can destroy our faith. Discouragement can cause people to take a direction in life that only leads to hopelessness. In every case scenario I've seen, hopelessness seems to always end in death, doesn't it? When that discouragement gets to the point, you know, to a point to where you get to a point of despair where you can't find a way out, you are in a very dangerous place in your mind. Because once it gets to that, once hopelessness takes over, or once, you know, once that hopelessness becomes fruitful and, 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 and causes you to think in a certain way, I can't prove it. I don't know the statistics, and I'm not there, but I am pretty sure 100% of people who, who get to that hopelessness state where there is no hope, there is no reason, it always ends it always, always ends in death. What would you say to that woman? Find hope. Well, where's she going to find it? She's got a brain. She's got a tumor inside of her brain that is killing her, causing her to debilitate her. And that's one thing discouragement does. It distracts us from carrying out God's desire to give us a hope and a future. You know, think about this for a moment. What would have happened? What would have happened if Jesus would have given into discouragement? On many occasions, he, he, he had the opportunity to escape and his fate. And, you know, that's when he said, you know, you know, Satan, get behind me, if you, if you recall those phrases. I mean, in, in those times, he had an opportunity to escape. He was tempted to step out, but, but he didn't give in to the temptation. Well, what would have happened if, if Helen Keller would have given in to discouragement? You better yet, Ann Sullivan, what if she would have given in to discouragement? Helen Keller, blind and deaf, was the first person who was deaf and blind to get, earn a bachelor's degree. And what about Ann Sullivan, the one who taught her? Can you imagine the being discouraging moments in those times? What would happen if Moses who would have given in to discouragement? It would have affected the history of the Jewish people, and it would have affected us Gentiles as well. What would have happened if Thomas Jefferson had given in to discouragement? We might be still be under the rule of England. What would happen if uh, William Timda had given in to discouragement? He translated the Bible into, into English, which at that time he did it was forbidden. He believed everyone should be able to read the Bible in their native tongue. He was later arrested and executed. He literally gave his life so that you could hold a Bible in your hand or have it on your phone or your tablet. What would have happened to the followers of Christ in the, in the books of Acts had given into discouragement and didn't go through all the ridicule, persecution, opposition? I'm pretty sure none of us would be sitting here. And Joseph, the guy we've been talking about the last few Sundays, hated by his brothers, raised in a dysfunctional home, framed for rape, thrown in the prison, forgotten about until Pharaoh needed his special ability to interpret dreams. If he had given him the discouragement of all the things that life had thrown at him, we, we wouldn't be reading his story today. He hadn't faced, if he hadn't faced all those discouraging moments in his life, now most of us, if not all of us, well, all of you said you did, so all of us in here have experienced discouragement, and the kind of discouragement that makes you, you know, uh, well, maybe not this, well, we all get discouraged, but there's a kind of encouragement, a discouragement that makes you wonder where God's at. You ever gone that far? That kind of discouragement where it makes you wonder if there's any line at the end of the tunnel, the kind of discouragement that if left unattended could destroy your faith. I mean, have, I mean that's really, they call it prolonged discouragement where you're just like, oh God, what is going on in my life? What are you doing? What the, this is one thing after another. Where are you at? Well, let me give you one point. You know, discouragement doesn't come from God. But God uses discouragement. 
He doesn't stop us from being discouraged. As we learned, and hopefully we've learned, discouragement is a part of life. Everybody faces discouragement, some more than others, some longer than others. Every single one of us have walked through that. And if you haven't, you will come to a period in your life unless you are the Messiah. Even he got discouraged. But discouraged doesn't come from God, and, but, and, it, and he doesn't stop us from being discouraged. It, it, it's just a part. It's a part of us, and everybody faces it. And, and if you honestly look at discouragement, though, okay, just take an honest. We all know the negative parts of discouragement. Hopefully, you, you've seen that picture painted. And if you honestly look at discouragement, it is also a good thing. It's no fun to go through, but it's a good thing. You know, discouragement, first of all, forces us to, to seek God. Think about this for a moment. In the times when we're faced, when we're faced uh, with the most pain, the suffering greatly, or tragedies coming in our lives, who do most people cry out to? And uh, who do they cry out to? We spend a lot of time. In those times, talking to God, asking why, where are you at? Where are you at? And a pastor shared a story of a mom who came into his office crying out about her son running away from God, and he, you know, the prodigal son story. And she said, I prayed and I prayed and I prayed and I prayed, but God doesn't seem to be doing anything. I've been seeking God. I've been asking for peace from God. The pastor's simple response was, sounds like God's got your attention. He didn't offer any flowery words. And he says, keep doing what you're doing, whether your son comes to God or not. Do you, do you hear that? You know, keep doing what you're doing, whether your son comes to God or not. Keep doing what you're doing, whether God brings healing in your body or not. Keep asking the questions that they're asking, whether God answers them or not. We want the answers, and we want it right now, <laughs> you know. But well, once you get the answer, what do you stop doing? Seeking after who? God. So once, sometimes he doesn't answer because, boy, you're seeking after him. And when we go through these difficult moments in life, when we go through discouragements in life, when we experience all these things, and we know that even unbelievers cry out to God. So why, why would God answer that prayer if you are seeking after him with everything you've got and you are talking to him? You know, when you talk to him, you're praying. You know that, right? No matter if it's anger or anything you're, you're saying to him, it's still a prayer no matter what you say. You can cuss him out. He's big enough to handle it. But you know, but that's what discouragement does. It, face, it forces us to seek after God. So discouragement is not a terrible thing. It is a good thing. Because we talk about, oh, how we need to follow God more closely. Oh, we need to do this. Oh, we need to do that. Then a tragedy comes along or something happens in your life that causes you to, to look, you know, that causes you to, to stumble and all that. And we cry out to God and we spend time crying out to God. Discouragement forces us to seek God. And the second thing, discouragement forces us to examine our own lives. You know, it's in a time of discouragement that we ask the most meaningful questions in life, doesn't it? Questions that we need to ask ourselves every so often to help us keep our life in perspective. I'm sure Joseph spent a lot of time, you know, examining his life. What else do you do in prison? What else do you do in the bottom of cistern? All you got is you and God. So, you know, discouragement forces us to examine our life, to ask those hard questions that we need to ask, I think, every single day of our life. And as ask God to examine our heart, Lord, is there anything impure in me? What is going on in my life? God, give me, give me some, you know, and again, going back to seeking after God and asking God to examine our heart. You see how that works? Because really, in those moments is when God has our full attention. And boy, and in those moments, we answer those questions honestly. Oh, everything. Every, okay, if I ask you how you're doing, what do you normally respond? Good. Okay. You know, I'm like, you know, I, I'm, I can't say that. So if you ask me that question, I'm going to ask you, how long do you have? Do you really want to know? 
do you really want to examine my life? Because our normal response is, okay, good. You know, when inside, you know, stuff is going on, we're hurting, or we've just been, you know, stuff we've gone through the day, and it's been a terrible, terrible, horrible, no good, very bad day. You know? No one knows. But discouragement forces us not only to examine our life and ask those questions, but to answer them honestly. You know? Just so you know, it's a lot easier to live in denial. And the third thing discouragement does, it forces us to make a decision. Oh, my. You know, this is true. You know, this is true if you've been, you know, living in discouragement for a really long time. There comes a point when you get sick and tired of being sick and tired, you get sick and tired of being discouraged, and you need to do something. And a, a young man I was mentoring for a while, mentored him for like three months. And this, his life was falling apart. His, his wife had kicked him out, and, and, and his wife kicked him out and told him to figure life out and grow up. Now, I was with him in the most, you know, I was with him in the most discouraging moments of his life. And like a good, to- like a good counselor, I told him, I told him, uh, uh, you know, it, it was, it, it, this problem he had was not his wife or his family. I said, the problem is you. You're the problem. Don't, don't, you, don't you love that? We love to blame everybody else for our insecurities. We love to blame everybody else for our immaturity. We love to blame everybody else. You know, for the bad things that happen to us, I don't know, and we love to do that. And I, I you know, being a good counselor, I was. I said, "You're the problem." He said, "I told him, you know, it doesn't matter if you get your wife back or not. It doesn't make a difference unless you're willing to face your stuff, deal with your discouraging moments in life, and do something about it." <laughs> Here's the amazing part: he actually listened to me. How many people actually listen to their pastor? Most of you won't be able to tell me what I said 10 minutes after you leave here. And that's what the video and the writing out and everything I try to get to remember. He actually listened. And do you know what he's doing now? He's pursuing ministry. Holy smokes, who saw that coming? He made a decision. His wife had kicked him out. Grow up. Come back to me when you're ready to grow up. And he did. And he met with me for three or four months. I just told him flat out truth. You are the problem, boy. Grow up. Give up your childishness. Do something with your life that is meaningful. And he did. And he did. You know, his discouragement with the way his life was going forced him to make a decision to grow up and to be a loving husband, a mature God, and a godly man. <laughs> See, guys, I'm not that bad. I really am pretty good. If you, if you listen, you know. Well, that's boastful. Paul says something about that, doesn't he? I'm just saying his life has been transformed, not by me, but he actually listened, I believe, to the voice of the Holy Spirit who's been speaking to him through this whole time. I just happened to be the one to be there and actually listen to his pain, listen to his discouragement and say, you know what? You need to make a decision. Let this be a moment that will transform your life. And it did. And the same is true for everybody, I believe. There comes a moment in our life, I believe it happens in every one of us, there comes a moment in our life where, we're, where we say, man, God, I'm sick and tired of this. I'm sick and tired of what I'm, I'm sick and tired. And Lord, I'm sick and tired of being, discour- I'm just sick and tired of being discouraged. God, I need to do something. Lord, I need for you to come. I need for you to show up. I need for you to change my life. I need for you to transform the way I think. Lord, I need for you. And God, I just can't do it anymore. It's called surrender. But discouragement forces us to make a, you know, uh, you know, uh, these kinds of decisions. And then as Christ followers, if you're a Christ follower, Paul reminds us that 2 Corinthians 4, 8, 9 says, We are pressed on every side by troubles, 
but we're not crushed. We are perplexed, but not driven to despair. We are hunted down, but never abandoned by God. We get knocked down, but we are not destroyed. Folks, we might be pressed on every side by troubles, but God is not going to let you be crushed. Did you catch that? Troubles are going to come your way, but God is not going to let you be crushed. The enemy can't lay a finger on you. He can't lay a finger on you. He can discourage you. We we might be perplexed, meaning life is confusing at times, but God is not going to let you go to points of despair. We might be hunted down. God is not going to abandon abandon us. He is with us. That's all he promised he would do, folks. He promises that he will never leave us or forsake us. He says, if you're hunted down, just remind you, you know, people are at you and in life is coming at you, he is with you. We might get knocked down, discouraged, but God is not going to allow us to be destroyed because the enemy can't lay a finger on you. He can't. He can't lay a finger on you. In the cosmic world, it's beyond our imagination. He can't lay a finger on you. But he can discourage you. To be honest with you, discouragement is a good thing because discouragement is an opportunity to exercise our faith. You know, we get to find out if these promises of these verses are true. You know, without discouragement, we wouldn't need to persevere at anything, would we? Would we? If you didn't have discouragement in your life, would you need to persevere? We wouldn't need perseverance because life would be made. So discouragement is a good thing because it teaches us how to persevere. Discouragement turns a good story in all of us. If you've given your life to Christ, you know, it's a good story. It becomes a great story when you, when you go through discouragement. And God uses that. God uses that to inspire others to seek him, inspires others to go the extra mile, inspires others to love their enemies, inspires others to give generously, inspire others to make a life decision. We spend, some of you read a lot, we spend a lot of time reading about these people. Well, why can't it be you? Why can't it be you when you face discouragement and you persevere? Why can't that? Why can't God use your story? Why can't that be you? Why can't we allow God to use our discouragement to cause us to persevere and allow God to use that story to inspire others to seek after him? Isn't that not why we are here on earth? Isn't that not why we are here on earth? Yes, we are. If you are a Christ follower, you are called to persevere. You are called to persevere. It's not whether they write a book about you. It's about whether one young man is transformed or that person in your life is transformed by God. It's not about you. It's about whether that other person is transformed and inspired to seek after God and let God transform them. You see how that works? Let God make your story great. And like I said, as Christ followers, we're expected to persevere. We're expected to use the discouraging things. We're expected to use discouraging things to seek the face of God. We are to use these discouraging things going on in our life to examine our life and keep things in perspective. You know, we're, 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 you know, we're expected to use the encouraging things to make a decision that will change our life forever. And when life gets tough, and when things get tough and life is full of pain, boy, we get the opportunity to find if, ah, if these promises are true. This morning, I don't know if you're walking, if you're, if you're, if you're full, if you're experiencing discouragement or, you know, things are weighing in your mind, just not sure where God's at or, you know, this, you know, attempted like this, you know, young lady to get to the point of hopelessness to where, man, I don't know what else to do. And this morning as we sing, uh, 
And this song, I, Jonathan let me pick this song out today. Because uh, you know, the words are so powerful to me anyway. And as we sing them this morning, I just pray, boy, if you were in discouragement, that you sing these words loud. As if you're crying out to God, you know, your act of worship. To sing loud, out of tune, whatever. And let God speak to your heart and let God 